The Center for Educational Media and the College of Education at Middle Tennessee State University are proud to offer professional development to K-12 teachers in Tennessee through our online video library. These videos are aligned with the Tennessee academic standards. For more professional development videos, check out our website at cem.mtsu.edu. This video is aligned with the following Tennessee academic standards. Uh, today, uh, I'm Stacy Graham. Some of you already know kind of what we do in these sessions. Uh, we want to give you materials that you can take back and use directly in your classroom. Um, let me show you first kind of where you can find this online. So here is our website and you can go to library.mtsu.edu slash TPS. You are going to, if you're not already on our mailing list to get our newsletters every month, you'll be getting that and that way you'll be getting links every month to our materials. So here's our website. All of our newsletters and lesson plans and everything else are archived here. Uh, the starving time activity we're doing today was uh, done for last month's work uh, newsletter on working with text-based primary sources. So this is what one of our newsletters looks like. And this is the activity that we're going to be doing right here at the bottom of page two. So that's where you can go if you want links to all the PowerPoints and worksheets that you're going to see here today. Basically, we get a lot of teachers, especially the ones who deal with younger grades, so maybe like, you know, third through fifth grade or even sixth through eighth grade. Uh, the standards uh, require reading excerpts from a lot of very difficult texts, and teachers struggle with the kinds of materials that they can use to help these students approach these texts in class. So we've been trying to develop more materials uh, along those lines in response to that need. So this is an example of that, uh, reading an excerpt of the text, starting time. So first of all, I say the word excerpt all the time. I know what it means. You know what it means. Do your students know what an excerpt means? Or is that a new word for them? And thinking about this uh, for a fourth grade classroom, I would assume that maybe fourth graders aren't as familiar with the word excerpt. So basically, uh, this is the PowerPoint, not from me to you, but this is the PowerPoint that you would download and use in class which is why it has stuff that you guys already know, but your students might not. So just kind of explaining what is excerpt, uh, because I realize that's a word I throw around a lot, and I shouldn't be assuming that all your students are going to know what it is, and we obviously don't want to scare them off before they've even started. So that's just going through some examples and some definitions. Basically, if you can read and understand one good size excerpt from a text, you should be able to do that with just about any excerpt from that text. So uh, a lot of students balk at very long things to read, and so we're just trying to help them develop skills for tackling kind of a smaller section, and those skills then they can apply to others. So basically, when they're dealing with a primary source text or any primary source that's difficult, you obviously as a teacher start off by kind of telling them what they're learning about. What is the content? What is the context? So what is the starving time? What does this refer to? That way they're not so lost when they're reading the words. So the starving time, we're talking about US colonial history. We're talking about the first English colony, Jamestown in Virginia. So we're looking at the winter of 1609 to 1610. And this is one of the first contingents of colonists. Uh, they're not prepared. They, they were not prepared uh, to farm enough food for them because they were hoping that there'd be more ships bringing them supplies. Uh, and they were hoping they'd be able to trade with the Indians. That didn't work. Uh, the Indians near about were very hostile to them, as your students who have seen Pocahontas will know. Um, 
And then there was a drought that decimated the crops that they did manage to grow. And then the supply of food that they were waiting for coming from England got blown off course all the way to Bermuda. And so they had no food. They were literally starving. From about 500 of them, only about 60 survived. That's pretty bad. So once your students have this kind of, oh, this is the general arc of this story. This is where I can now make sense of all the words I'm going to be reading. OK. And then we like to, whenever we're dealing with complex text, bring in image-based primary sources because students respond better to those usually. And so this is a really neat map that um, is from the year 16, uh, it's from like 1609 or 1610, but it's based on information that uh, John Smith gave to this map maker in 1606. So that's why it's dated down there. And so first of all, you'd show this to students. And so I know that you can't quite see it very clearly from where you're sitting. Obviously, when you're looking at this on a computer screen, which I could do, you just click on the image. It'll take you to the bibliographic page at the Library of Congress that has this map, and then you can zoom in. And so basically, we want them to do kind of some general observations. What kinds of things are on this map? It's very hard to read. So I'm not really expecting that your students are going to be able to, oh, signification of these marks to the crosses have been discovered. Yeah, I'm not really expecting them to like, get all those words, but they can say, oh, this is a drawing of what looks like an Indian. What other kinds of things do you notice, like about the orientation or the kinds of things that are shown? Anybody want to start observing things? Crown. Sorry? The crown. The crown at the top. The crown. Yes. Why is there a crown at the top, do you think? Oh. That's yeah. the seal of the uh, colony, isn't it? It's a royal colony. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because that's the, uh, you can see Ireland, Scotland, that's the uh, Stuart. This is Great Britain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. What other things do you notice? The waterways. Yes. Right. This is going to be different from, you know, your students looking at maps today where they usually see roads. Uh, the main things they're going to see are the geographical features. So these waterways, which are very important, and you can help them kind of spell out Chesapeake Bay. Um, Sorry? Oh, I'm trying to figure out the orientation. Sure. Yes. What is this orientation? It's on its side. Yes. This is the James River. Yeah. Is this a mirror image? No. Well, so this James, so basically we just need to do it this way. So you know how the James is going up, but the James needs to go to the left. It's supposed to go to This little fleur-de-lis is pointing north. Okay. So north is this way, and west is this way and this is a good lesson to your students never to assume that north is always going to be on top because in the big matter of space it's relative well don't use that word students don't know what to make of it okay <laughs> <laughs> anyway so what other kinds of things do you see now that we're a bit more oriented and this right here is the james river the one on the far okay. left you can see the Powhatan confederation yeah string together those letters Powhatan. Yes. Compared to detective today's maps, it's littered with all the little T symbols that must mean something in the key about what grows there or what's available. Wish there were a key. That would help, wouldn't it? <laughs> but yes, so example, uh, what are all these little things there? Uh, what do all these little, look, here's a little house. Here's another little house. And they all have names. Well, even the bottoms of the caves there have this. What is that? This wiggle. This is a lot of time on his hands. Yeah. Uh, Somebody must have paid him good money. Yeah. He wouldn't have made it this fancy. 
<laughs> this is a very fancy map. I mean, this is map maker, yeah. Get your money's work, right? <laughs> yes, yes. Well, of course, the Virginia colony. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, he's, he's drawing it off of a verbal description of someone else, and it's an imaginary picture. Right. Remember, the map maker himself hasn't seen any of this. He's getting this off of John Smith. I bet you got those pictures of the Powhatans. I wonder if those come from, uh, oh, the dude, the dude in North Carolina. Um, what was his name? Not that guy. The, that, that person looks very similar to the drawings of the early Native Americans that were drawn in North Carolina mm -hmm. back in the 1400s. He was with Raleigh. He drew all the, he drew all these pictures of Native Americans, and that looks like a very similar. Um, well, let me ask you, let me get back to this idea that this is not drawn from somebody who actually saw it. This is drawn based on other people's descriptions of it. So you might want to throw your students for a bit of a loop and say, so is this a primary or a secondary source? Ooh, ooh, evil of you. Yes. <laughs> so, or is it just an art piece? What would you think? Yeah. Yes. Art is art piece. <clears throat> yeah, art, yes, well, yes. yes, it is an art piece. Yes, it is there. Some of that is, is based on surveyed information, and some of it is just what must be there. Remember, map makers back then, why did he fill it up with all that stuff? That's what they did. Nobody pays you for empty paper. This is where you have to think about pretty much all maps in general would be secondary sources if you would require them to have been all those places. So the maps are a little bit different, I think. But this captures the way the, the picture that these people had of what was there in Virginia at this time. And so this is the most up-to-date information for this time period about what you could find there. And now you ask them to find Jamestown. I will zoom in to help you all out. Yes, please. <laughs> I have very bad eyes, and I'm really close to it. It's over here. I see it. Off the James. Oh, Jamestown. Yeah, it's right on the James. The there Charlie, would you like to point? There it is. Your students might have a little bit of confusion because the, the J is spelled with an I. Um, in the Latin alphabet, the J starts with an I. Sorry, I just had an Indiana Jones moment. And, uh, and then there's an E on the end of town, so it looks a little different from our modern spelling of Jamestown. But not so different that one of your more astute students couldn't find it. They would just have to look at this map a long time to find it because there's so many words on it. So yeah, this idea that you fill it up uh, with all these things, imaginary or not. So they've actually, they've actually managed to, they know where a lot of these things are already. This isn't like just uncharted wilderness. Uh, they have had a lot of contact with the Indians there, and they have done a lot of traveling. But... Obviously, they still don't know how to take care of themselves yet. So, um, yeah, once they kind of have looked at this map and they have a bit of an idea of, okay, we're talking about this area, we're talking about this particular episode of American history, um, then this is on the PowerPoint, the way that you find this. This is what I'm going to zoom in on for the next slide. So this is that zoomed in section. So you can see Jamestown right there. And you can see kind of uh, some of the things around it. In fact, this Werewokomoko, this is the place where John Smith supposedly was saved by Pocahontas, according to his 1624 general history, which we're going to read a little bit from later on. Not that particular episode. That's a different lesson plan that we have done in different sessions. But, um, but yes. OK, so what is the text? I had a really hard time <laughs> with this easy part right here. So this is why I found two texts. So there are different sources for what happened during the starving time. <sighs> the starving time referred to in the standards, John Smith's starving time, is from his 1624 book, The General History of Virginia. And this is the second book that he's written about the Virginia colony, not the first one. 
Um, the second one, by the way, is the one that has that fantastic episode about Pocahontas. The first one doesn't mention it, her at all, so that's an interesting thing. But there's another source that's from 1610. So this is even closer to when it happened, done by the Virginia Company. Of course, he was a part of the Virginia Company, but this is just you know, not ascribed to him. A larger work called A True Declaration of the Estate in Virginia. So this is to justify why it's worthwhile to invest money in the Jamestown colony. Now, after reading about what happened during the starving time, you'd think investors would want to run away. But obviously, there's more to it than just that. And we aren't going to be able to read all of it. Unfortunately, because that's the worst thing to read ever, this is a really awful text in terms of being very hard to read. So you do not want to show that to fourth graders. What do you want to do? All right. We don't usually do this, but a lot of teachers have asked us to. So for this particular lesson idea, I translated it into modern English. And I felt it was really necessary uh, for at least the second one of these. So this is the John Smith excerpt, the slightly less hard of the two primary source texts. So when you're doing this, uh, with eighth grade, you start here. We're doing this as fourth grade, you start here. Eighth graders are going to go on and read the other one as well. So eighth graders are going to read two excerpts. The fourth graders are just going to read this one. And so you all are going to read both of them. And here's the excerpt. And here is the worksheet. So basically, this is the... Um, translation that I made of the original text and put it on a worksheet. It's in the box and then there are thought questions beside it. So you go through, you read it, and then once you've read it, you can go over some of these thought questions with the people at your tables. And then we'll all get back together and start talking about them. Yeah, but when you come to a place planning on, you know, stepping off the boat and sitting around on your butt and have the Indians bring you food. <laughs> oh. You can sit there and go, then why, does that, why does that tell you about why they were there? Yeah. You know, I don't want to ask a great colonist. They're not like us, so, yeah. so it's okay. You don't treat them the same. No, but it's an odd word, and basically it means barbecued. And the kids are always like, "What does that mean?" <laughs> so when was this? When so he wrote this in 1624. What time was it when the starting time happened? What was our date on that? 1608. So he's looking. He's looking back at it in retrospect. But he wasn't even there. So. What percentage of the original 500 colonists survived? 12. About 12 percent. Yeah. And you can even almost use the word decimated here because that means, actually no, this is like the reverse of decimated. Decimated means one in every 10. This is almost nine out of every 10. So 12 percent survived. That's, yeah. What does this make you think about the experience of being a colonist in the New World? It's very difficult. To <laughs> <laughs> say the least. Yeah. Survival is very yeah. chances. And then when this comes out, you wonder. That's what the thing always has made me wonder is they knew that it was really going to be hard in the New World. Everybody can base. I mean, this is 1624. <laughs> Yet people still go. Yes. And that's the thing that always has made me wonder. How bad was it in Europe? <laughs> if you're willing to cross an ocean, or how, you know, I guess how much money did you think you were going to make? Right, right. And there are other lesson plans about why did they come? So what was, yeah, what's going on in Europe at this time? Yeah. Inquisition. Uh, it's a little late for the Inquisition. You know, 1600s. Yeah. Religious wars. Yeah, but you still got the effects. The, yeah, well, there, there are later Inquisitions, but uh, these, are the, these are the wars of religion. The wars of religion, Catholic versus Protestant, um, pretty much wreaking uh, terror uh, across all of continental Europe as well as uh, England, Ireland. With the help of social mobility be a motivator? Yeah, it would. Because that's pretty much a no-go in Europe. Yeah. 
So, and then there are all those kind of individual hopes, like freedom of religion, freedom from war, <coughs> social mobility, profit. Adventures in spirit. Yes. Also, the, the fact that Jamestown came with so many men and so, so little prepared to actually be colonists, the question is, were they really colonists? They, you know, a lot of them were adventurers looking for fast money and go home. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so, and it's obvious from the, the story that they weren't really there to be self-sufficient. Right, yes. These, this first crew is mostly men. This isn't like families ready to settle. These aren't like homesteaders. And so, and of course the Virginia Company, I don't know that much about it, but you'd want to talk about it with your students. This is a commercial venture. And it doesn't actually become profitable until someone discovers, it's John Rolfe, oh, we can plant tobacco and make lots of money. Finally, no more starving. But it took a long time to get to that point. Uh, but yeah, the purpose was to actually do something that would reap profit for the investors and then hopefully the people who were doing this could benefit off that as well. But they have a percentage of what, what men, how many men became, actually had the skills that were needed to be able to sustain themselves? I don't know. You know, you, I, I could be evil and tell you all that you need to ask the colonial history scholar who's going to be during the fourth session time today in the other room talking about the state of Franklin. Ha, 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 ha. You see, you can ask Dr. Nelson, uh, but uh, sorry for deflecting all these intricate questions. <laughs> They're really good, but colonial history is not really my thing, which is why I did this activity so I could start learning about it. They're mostly like men of leisure. I mean, the archaeological evidence from Jamestown, pretty much. I mean, they brought. And they have really great websites. And people yeah, are like for that. as opposed to living somewhere where they would have grown their own food. Well, yeah, you're, you're getting these guys from London. I mean, they don't grow their own <laughs> food in London in the 1600s. They're buying it from the country. Right. And then, of course, there's just the weather and the conditions that you know, they're not really prepared for. Okay, so um, why might they have dug up an Indian to try to eat as opposed to one of the colonists? Because they were like animals. They weren't considered much. Okay, so if the Indians were subhuman, it was less bad to eat one? They would have known the colonists too. They so they would have known that person personally mm -hmm. rather than an enemy. Right. Okay. Um, and then I, I think it's interesting how, but the man who did that to his wife was executed as he well deserved. But I don't know if the people who ate the Indian were executed, it doesn't say. So, and then, uh, now whether she tasted better roasted, boiled, or broiled, I don't know, but I never heard of a dish of salted wife before. Um, why would the author wonder about the different ways this woman could be cooked? <laughs> because he wasn't very things to study to be what? Glib cells. I mean, you know, being glib and offhand. <laughs> so you think that he was trying to be glib here? That's what it's coming across as. It came across as that. Yeah. What are some other ideas? It's an unthinkable thing, and you kind of mm -hmm. inject. I mean, it's kind of that. You know, yeah. try to inject some levity into something that's completely unthinkable and outside the pale. I mean, the idea of cannibalism is always outside of what we think of being human. Well, and to think of people being so desperate mm -hmm. that they're going to eat each other, which they've proved with archaeological evidence really did happen. They you know, did eat each other. Um, I think maybe he was just trying to, you know, almost make it less, hum like, get rid of the humanity in there because, you know, the idea of somebody... Right, making it into an object. Yeah, right. Yeah. Make, okay. Making the wife into an object. Of course... You know, who knows what the relationship was between them and his wife. Well, it goes to purpose, too, because Smith, like the, like the earlier one, is still trying to convince people to support it and take part. So he can't leave that image of the starving man eating his wife as the last picture. Right. That, he, you can't sell that picture, so you've got to replace it with something more marketable. Right, right, right. And maybe make it a little bit ridiculous, but, you know. Yeah, this is unthinkable. Let's think about it, um, and let's let me recast it in a way. What, but and time has also passed. I mean, this is 1624. Right. You're talking about this is a period of time that has passed since the event. And that's yeah. We have like 14 years here, so this is a really good thing for your students to keep in mind. Okay, uh, what does the author blame the starving time on? Well, 
<laughs> yeah. There, there was not good leadership. They didn't get it together. They weren't prepared. It says they didn't work hard. They didn't honor God. And they didn't cooperate. Yeah. So he's squarely laying the blame on that first group of colonists. Now, John Smith himself, he like had gotten injured and he actually was back in uh, England before this particular winter happened. So he himself was not there. But he knew all the people who were there. Well, that might be part of it too, because Smith, I mean, he was right, well, he basically had to come in and basically rule the colony with martial law. And then he leaves and he's like, I think he kind of thought to himself, I had this all set up. I leave and they just start eating each other willy-nilly. <laughs> so he's probably trying to kind of like yeah. put that to where, you know, our lack of goodwill from God, because you know, I got hurt and I had to leave them, so it's not my fault. Not my fault. How, how does this make you feel about the colonist experience now? You don't have as much empathy you can think that. You got it together. Right. What were they thinking, right? Uh, hindsight. Okay, so why would the author want to make sure the reader knows there was nothing wrong with the land of Virginia itself? It was not because something was wrong with Virginia, because eventually it became an excellent place to grow crops, as has been thought. Why is this sentence in there? Yeah, this is the main purpose, right? Keep the people coming, keep the investors investing in this. So yeah, this happened. How interesting a man ate his wife, but it was their fault. It was just this group of people. This is not, this is, does not speak to the larger colony itself, which has potential. Um, yeah. So what do you think about the language in this passage? Personally, I'm grateful for the translation. Yeah. Right. <laughs> OK. Do you think fourth graders could read it? Still difficult for them, but they could read it. Yeah. If you did a read aloud, I mean, at least I, what I would have probably done when I taught eighth grade, because most of my kids read on about a third grade, fourth grade level, I would have probably done a read aloud, and then okay. we would have gone through the questions. That's a good um, idea. Just so that you can, I would do that. I used to do that a lot, though, because mm -hmm. then you could kind of explain what was going on in addition. And the kids yes. that could read on eighth grade level, they could just go through it and start answering. But the kids that struggled could kind of follow along. And that's a really good idea. And another good reason why it's a smaller size. So this is where, um, again, I don't like scaring students because it doesn't take much to scare them away from text. But I do like showing people where things come from. So this is where it comes from. Aren't you, and then you can say, aren't you glad I didn't make you read this, students? Uh, it is this particular section right here, starting down here and going up there. Now, this is a later edition. It's, you know, it's not like reading a manuscript copy or anything, but you still have kind of funny spellings. You still have the, the very complex language. And you all, yourselves, might want to read the original just to make sure that the translation that I came up with is the, you know, along the lines that you would want in terms of accuracy. I'm not saying you have to read it right now. I'm saying it's on the PowerPoint slide uh, so you can get it later. But so just showing your students that these things that when you run across a text, it comes from someplace else. It has to kind of pass through different filters before it gets to you and gets into a state that you can read it. Now, the second excerpt from The Starving Time uh, for eighth graders. I'm going to pass this out. We're not going to spend as much time on it. Um, basically, we'll just, you know, same kind of deal. It was translated from the original. And first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you, while you're looking at it, kind of what I did to it. And if you want to show uh, an interested group of eighth I always assume that kids want to learn this stuff, which is probably not always the best place to start. Um, but, you know, I'm just such a nerd, that's kind of where I, I don't understand why you wouldn't want to know. Uh, I'm like that with my college students, too, and, eh, nah, well. So anyway, this is this section right here. Here's your worksheet. This is where it comes from. 
And these are the sections that I took it from, so I had to read this. Now, when you look at this on the Library of Congress, it has this really good, this is a new feature, and I really like it. You click on this page, it'll come up as an HTML. Like, you can say view text, and instead of looking at this, it'll show you the HTML that's already been trans transcribed. Not translated, transcribed. So they put it into HTML, which is great, because then you can copy paste it straight from there, which is what I did. Uh, and it kind of, you know, makes it a little bit more legible. So when you look at the original text, this is where it scares students to look at these things. This is the, this is the key, by the way, for what's going to come after this. So we have circles where U's that should be V's and a V that should be a U. Underlining words that aren't spelled the same, underline difficult vocabulary words. So this is kind of what I went through. Just to show your students that, look, if you can read <coughs> any of this, you are doing good. Um, so the fact that this is written for grown-ups 400 years ago doesn't mean that I expect you to be able to read this right now today without any help. So these are the steps that we go through. And I think once they start realizing that those U's are V's, they start clicking a little bit. And then you have vocabulary words that they're going to have to definitely look up or you're going to have to supply. Um, words that maybe they know what tear means, they know what pieces means, but they haven't seen it spelled like that before. So they just have to kind of replace that in their minds. So here is an excerpt from the excerpt. So when you have something that is the ground of all those miseries was the permissive providence of God, I ended up with the basis of all those terrible things was the will of God since God allowed lots of things to happen. Providence is kind of hard to explain. <laughs> I think, in uh, eighth grade language. So that's kind of what I came up with. Who in the aforementioned violet and storm separated the head from the body? Now they might be like, separated the head from the body? So in the violent storm mentioned above in the paragraph that would have come before this one, God separated the head from the body, meaning that he separated the head of the group, Sir Thomas Gates, from the body of the group, the rest of the people. And this is the ship that got lost in Bermuda. That was Thomas Gates' ship. So all the vital powers of regiment being exiled with Sir Thomas Gates in those unfortunate yet fortunate islands. Islands. All the important powers of taking charge, again, this lack of leadership thing, were exiled with Sir Thomas Gates in those fortunate yet unfortunate islands. What does that mean? Fortun unfortunate yet fortunate. It's unfortunate because it's far from Virginia, but it's fortunate because I don't know, it's warm and pleasant there. I don't know. And they had the food, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. He was fun. Yeah. All right, so now go ahead and read. You could talk about, you know, the idea of providence and God. Yeah, sure. For all they knew, like every day, like he'll be here tomorrow. He'll be here tomorrow. So there were some supplies, and that's what the people were fighting. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not sure if you would have time in a single class period to go over both of these text excerpts with your eighth graders. Um, if that's the case and you still wanted to use both, you could obviously divide the room in half and do it that way. But the standards are specific about the John Smith's starving time, so that was the excerpt that we already read. And this one is kind of another look at it. Uh, this is, again, as you saw from a larger work, and there's a passage later on that does talk about somebody eating somebody else. So if you wanted to use that one instead, then you can translate that one, and it could all be about cannibalism. Um, eighth graders would probably be even more excited about that kind of thing. So in this one, how did God separate Thomas Gates from the rest of the people? The storm. Yeah. Basically, the storm is an act of God. Even your insurance says so. So, um, yes, that was definitely will of God. Thomas Gates, gone. Well, he's not dead. He's in Bermuda. <laughs> oh, darn. <laughs> Shipwrecked, okay. It's not all like, you know, Sandals Resort. Okay, Bermuda, James, yeah. <laughs> What is the author saying Gates would have done if he had been there instead of being separated? Take charge. Take charge. Yeah. 
Yeah. Leave the right? Game. Now, of course, Once he shows back up, that's a moot point at, right now. This is, this is what would have happened if what happened didn't happen. But still, this shows you kind of the Virginia company, what they're very much trying to do with this piece. If he had been there, if this freak storm hadn't happened, excuse me, um, yes. Okay, why would the author can bear disagreements among the colonists to a storm or shipwreck? It's turbulent, just like a storm. And just like it, like the, just like a storm or a shipwreck can tear a body apart, mm -hmm. that's what's happening in the colony. You know, and yeah. although would the would it go then that the the storm among the colonists was also an act of God? Is that what they're trying to say? I don't know. I kind of thought about that myself. But he's so you know here he's just gotten finished saying that oh my gosh this terrible storm. You know you can imagine how much damage that would wreak, and then the shipwreck. Well, that's damage, but even worse than that is the fact that these people cannot agree. So it's really setting it above as worse. And yet this would actually have been preventable. So that's probably what makes it worse. So what seems to happen to individuals in a group when there's no one to take charge? Like if you were to leave your classroom for 15 minutes and have them figure out what to do? Oh, yeah. so, so what seems to happen? You have too many chiefs and none of the meetings. <laughs> <laughs> Very apropos. <laughs> right. So again, this is getting down to, like, at the core, this is leadership problems. Um, so what's the importance of having a clear leader? You need to have someone to enforce the rules. Yes. Both justice and purpose. Yes. Focus and... Yeah, the justice to punish such obnoxious disobedience. If you're looking for anything more than a great reality TV show, because in a great reality TV show, you have to take out that so that you have Gosh, a chaos. The starving time is reality TV. I'm sure that there is a lesson plan in there somewhere. <laughs> I'm not creative enough to think about that, though, when I'm writing these newsletters. I just like, oh, let's read the actual. Yeah. I, got, I got a group of kids teaching AP US that did a reality show on the War of the Three Henrys for AP Euro. So I can probably get them to do a reality on the starving side. That would, I would love to hear how that goes down. The people of Belgium. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they got disturbed over what you did? Well, yeah, because they did it in Red Caboose Park in Bellevue, and they were fighting with foam noodles in the middle of Red Caboose Park. There was another one where a kid went after a local Chaos. in the middle of his subdivision. That's, that's what happens when there's no clear leader, right? <laughs> and then they started eating each other in the middle of Bellevue? Um, I'm sure there might be a way they can work that. I'll, All right. You might need to get like a permission form from your parents. OK. And so at the end of all this, you know, I want to bring everybody back together and have them think about what they've read a little bit. So I just posed four discussion questions on the PowerPoint slide. So back in the first excerpt, what are the reasons for the starving time? Can you remember? No. They didn't work hard enough. They didn't work hard enough. God was against like them. God was against them. Somewhere else. There was a lot of there's really Well, he didn't use that one. Yeah. All right. And what were the reasons for the starving time in this passage from the Virginia companies? Okay. The storm. Storm. Lost the ship. The leader? Gone. Head? Kaput is actually Latin for head, so that's kind of funny that I was about to say that. Anyway, okay, so yes, and these things, of course, complement each other. What happens when there's no leader? And the fact that clearly no other person steps up to take the place is chaos. They don't know what to do. They're not prepared. It relies too much on a leader here, obviously. Okay, so how do these works describe the hardships of the starving time? This would be kind of a summative, have them kind of summarize what they've learned. What are the main hardships here that lead to the starving time? Why are they starving? Lack of food. Lack of food. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I love the obvious answers because the students Indian are usually Indian too afraid to say them. them any more food because the Indians didn't have any food. Okay, so Indians not cooperating. 
is a drought, so the Indians didn't have food to even cooperate with. But of course, it, yeah, the population's growing. The, copy, the, the crops weren't growing, they didn't know what to do. Yeah, they didn't have the plot on them. Yeah. And the population had kind of grown past the point of sustainability without significant assistance from the Indians. So the Indians don't have any food. The Indians yeah. aren't giving them food. So they go after the Indians because, of course, if the Indi you know, the Indians aren't cooperating, so nothing to do with the fact there's no rain. It's just, you know, the Indians aren't being nice to us, so we're <laughs> going to go kill them because that's going to help the situation. And then they really aren't going to get any food from the Indians. <laughs> yeah, all that. And then this is the question that they're sitting through the entire classroom wondering to themselves. Why is it important to know about the starving time today? Why do they have to learn about this? Because it could have been the end of that colony. Yeah. This is one of those bottlenecks in history, right? This is, you know, the very first permanent English settlement in the United States. And of course, there are other settlements for other reasons from other places this is the one that eventually is going to kind of become the behemoth that establishes the United States later on. And it almost ate itself to death. You can, you can always focus on the people who died, but there's a point in time where you have to look at the 60 that survived. And you have to say, you know, that, those are the people that went on to build this nation. Well, those and the other people who came on the next ship. People like them. People like them. Those survivors. Those people who, you know, yeah, they propped up people in the woods that were dead to stay and watch. You know, they did all these. Sure, it happened. We get it. You know, they ate people. Scrappy. But they lived and they survived. And that's, that's that kind of mindset or whatever is, is what built this country. That's and, why we're here. And this country is such a, at the beginning, such a, collection of little experiments, many of which actually failed. This one almost did, completely. But you also have a great segue into the things that caused them not to succeed. Their lack of hard work, their lack of cooperation, the arrogance of nobody can tell me anything, uh, are all How is particularly it relevant today? applicable to the human condition at all times, but yes. particularly today. Very good. So. And you also can use this as a jumping off point to, you know, you talk about, okay, here's Virginia, and this is what's going on there. Now let's look at Massachusetts. Why is Massachusetts so different? You know, yes. so you can really, you know, it's, it's, it's such a stark contrast, that it's really good, which is good for the kids to understand. Then you understand why does Massachusetts and the Northeast develop so differently than the Southern colonies. This has other links in it that you can use to supplement this lesson. Like, for example, there is a Jamestown primary source set on the Library of Congress where you can find this map and other things uh, to go with that. And there's a teacher's guide with that. Here is a Today in History about Jamestown. There's that map again. Here's the inset of Powhatan uh, looking at the old church. So there is a lot of other things that you can use um, to kind of supplement that. This would be good for fourth graders, this particular section of the America's um, library from the Library of Congress website. Very, it's already at that reading level for third through fifth grade. Um, so explore those other links within that lesson idea, and uh, you can kind of supplement this as you need. You can download the PowerPoint from there and everything that you need. And if you want anything else that we may have mentioned today, uh, just email me.